family car. The store's owners make a huge effort to persuade people to use alternative and greener means of transport to get here. And as we've seen, the day when we all drive electric cars or cycles to the superstore is not so far away. This is one store that is putting into practice the ideas that may change our environment for the better. Underneath this huge icy landscape is a very interesting environment for scientists, a subglacial lake. It is Lake Vostok in the eastern Antarctic. There are no images of the lake, but remote sensing work indicates it's a 500 metre deep dark body of water with 300 metres of sediment on its bottom. But reaching the lake is a major challenge. It's covered by four kilometres of ice. Lake Vostok was discovered almost by accident five years ago during a drilling project. The ice core contained air bubbles which gave scientists an amazing insight into the local atmosphere over four climactic periods. That's more than 400,000 years. The data confirmed information about greenhouse gases and global warming, and it's this sort of information which will be invaluable to science. A major workshop and conference was put into place to set out the long-term plan to study the lake. Biologists are fascinated because it's one of the planet's few extreme environments. We know a lot about life in hot springs, however the other end of the scale is something we don't know much about. NASA is also showing interest in the project. Its Origins of Life program involves traversing, exploring and penetrating large icy surfaces like the polar ice caps of Mars. The technology needed to do this would be similar to that needed at Lake Vostok. NASA says Lake Vostok shares many characteristics with Jupiter's moons, Callisto and Europa. Europa is a moon about the size of our moon. It has an icy shell. The icy shell is about the same thickness as the ice over Antarctica. Underneath the icy shell, there's an ocean, which is vast, deep and dark. There's more water in that ocean than there is in all of ours, say NASA scientists. It was originally thought that Vostok was a freshwater lake, but the latest information suggests it may be brackish or salty, which may mean there are more potential nutrients to support life. However, nothing can be said for sure until the lake is explored. Drilling technology that wouldn't pollute Vostok's clean, untouched environment has yet to be invented. While initial equipment testing may be carried out at Lake Vostok next year, it may be more than a decade before this mysterious polar sea tells us its secrets. I wonder what it has to say. It may look like your average suburban house, but this home is a combination between cosy family life and the latest information technology. It's a house that's been wired to make life that little bit easier. Strategically placed webcams can act as an outside security system or enable parents to keep an eye on children in other parts of the house. The web pad, almost like a laptop computer but with no keyboard or wires, can be used anywhere to control the heating, lighting or any appliance through the integrated system. For the cost of a telephone call, parents away at work can still see their children and maintain close contact. In just one example of the applications, a child can do homework on the computer which can be remotely accessed by the parents for correction, supervision and interaction. So basically you can't get away with much. Turning on the evening dinner is only a flick of an electronic pen and watering your garden takes no more effort than pressing a button. You could say this house takes a hard work out of life. Next time Dad can't make it home for dinner, he can still be involved with the family meal. 
Now we just need smell cam. How great it would be to have a computer in every room with access to the rest of the house. I wonder if it'll pick up your laundry for you. The control centre of the system can fit easily into a broom cupboard and the components positioned throughout the home. The technology would add an extra 45,000 US dollars to the cost of a home, but suppliers say the price will decrease as the houses become more common. Technology like this is amazing and could be the window to the future in building designs. Still on the future in technology, here is the internet working at its best. This new internet system allows blind people to go supermarket shopping from the comfort of their own home. This is Hugh Hudley doing his weekly shopping. The partially sighted worker is using the internet system on his home computer that uses a voice to describe the goods on the shelves. It also shows what's available and guides you through the whole process. The system called Access has taken more than a year to develop, but it's changed the life for people like you. His final shopping list is sent at the click of a mouse. At the store nearby, Hugh's computer order is being transformed into reality. The goods are scanned and put in a basket. The new system works in the same way as online shopping and takes 6 million orders a week. Next step, the groceries are loaded up in the delivery van. The delivery driver offers an added service to blind customers, ringing to say that they're on their way. When the delivery arrives, the driver carries the groceries inside and even packs them away. The cost is £5 a delivery, the same as the standard service. For Hugh, this means he has more time to do other things rather than shopping. With the new service, you can do all your weekly shopping in 10 minutes. For Hugh and many blind or partially sighted people, it's a new and fantastic change to their lives. This is a story about a group of old timers who came together again to teach, help and inspire young minds while setting some awesome records along the way. Students from four American high schools have spent a lot of their free time working towards a common goal. That is to set the Guinness record for the world's largest paper aeroplane. Dr. Ferdinand Grossfeld, a supervisor working at NASA's Langley Research Centre, came up with the idea as a way to get students excited about engineering and science. He then approached four accomplished engineers, retired from NASA, to serve as advisors on the project. They taught the students aeronautical concepts like lift and drag, then let them come up with their own designs. They were fast learners by the looks of things. So they moved on to the next task. The record they were asked to break was to construct a plane with a 4.8 metre wingspan and flying a minimum of 15 metres. Paper and glue were the only materials allowed in construction. The greatest challenge was keeping the planes from collapsing under their own weight, but this was overcome with a clever tube rolling technique. Fly-offs in the Hampton City Schools gym were used to check the students' ideas. Although this 5.4 metre version seemed capable of breaking the record, the students decided to work towards an even larger model in case someone else established a new mark before their attempt. As part of the project, the students visited the NASA Langley facilities, including their subsonic wind tunnel, where they took part in an aerodynamic study involving a scale model of a transportation aircraft. Thanks to the glider Virginia Soaring, they were also able to experience what the forces felt like on a giant paper-like aeroplane. Finally, the day the students had been waiting for came. In a hangar at NASA Langley, they hoisted their 7.2 metre model onto a platform as specified in contest regulations. With record officials and supporters on hand, 
Kevin Kelly let the plane fly. It had to go 15 metres to break the record. It travelled nearly twice that far. And the students weren't done yet. With Will Perry doing the honours, they broke their own record using this 8.4 metre version. Then, as a grand finale, they launched a 9 metre craft, achieving yet another new milestone of just under 34 and a half metres. The record setting craft will now be displayed in Virginia's new Air and Space Centre alongside other historic planes. These players may not be aware of it, but with each swing of the bat and every connection between racket and ball, they're testing the engineering and design features behind a piece of a sporting equipment they're using. If you're a keen sports person, you'll probably be aware of the new developments in your sports equipment, like a stronger racket, a better grip, even a bouncier ball. This is science, and it's about to become an important subject at university. Sports technology is being introduced at some of the top schools around the world. Professor Roy Jones is an engineer by training. Here he is testing golf clubs in the university's sports laboratory. He's qualified to be involved in the development, design and manufacture of sports equipment for major companies and has been doing so for many years. He hopes the new degree course will create students that can develop and design new sports equipment. The three-year course will combine strength in the discipline of sports and engineering. It will involve the understanding of the human body and its capabilities, design and manufacture of sports equipment and business studies. This tennis ball cannon is firing balls at an angled racket. The camera and computer attached can track the velocity, spin, launch and rebound angles of the ball at a certain setting. Changing the tensions of the racket will give different measurements. Understanding this science will help students develop design changes which could lift the game itself. The information is vital to the sports yeah. equipment industry, which is worth almost 10 billion pounds and not surprisingly, given the money involved, is an extremely competitive market. The Bachelor of Science in Sports Technology degree is an area that any keen sports person could head into. Imagine if you were the designer of the golf clubs that Tiger Woods used to win a championship, or the tennis racket Andre Agassi holds in the air when he wins Wimbledon. It's another avenue of science that's bound to attract a lot of attention. If you have little brothers and sisters, you'll know that at an age of about six months old, babies spend most of their time exploring the new world around them. This little guy is just the same. In the mornings, he is busy climbing ropes and playing with toys in a special room at the Moscow Zoo. But like any other baby, he also demands and needs contact with others especially a hug to feel warm and secure. Unfortunately, this beautiful baby was rejected by his mother, and so he gets his loving from the zoo's keepers. His mother, a 15-year-old orangutan, was also an orphan and brought up in the zoo. When she had her baby, she just didn't have any mothering instinct. She tried to take care of her baby in the hours after birth, but didn't know what to do. She lost interest and her milk disappeared. The mother and the father now live in separate sections away from their child. And human zookeepers look after the growing boy each day. 
Zoos have been around for hundreds of years and until recently were full of bare cages that kept the animal purely as a display for visitors. Now, with the help of scientific research, zoos have become an important part of animal preservation. The best zoos provide the animals with plenty of space and the most natural environment as possible. This helps the animal to carry out its normal behavioural patterns and gives us, the visitor, a more realistic view. Some zoos have even saved animals from total extinction and have highlighted the need for action against illegal trading and logging. As we have discussed in other programs, the orangutan is an endangered species and although captive breeding programs aren't the most natural way to keep the species going, it may be the only chance these little guys have to continue on. It's thought that the zoos of the future would hold smaller animals rather than elephants and lions. Some animals become bored in the zoo and tend to pace constantly. They may even refuse to breed because they are not in their natural habitat. Giving the animals toys and even a television has helped to solve the boredom problem in the short term. Even monkeys need a puzzle or two to keep their minds active. What it really comes down to though is our awareness of a problem that is caused by humans and can only be solved by humans. After an oil spill off the coast of Australia recently, the Tasmanian Conservation Trust made an appeal for woolly jumpers to protect these tiny fairy penguins. When it's cold outside, you put on a jumper, right? Well, so do penguins. These fairy penguins are all set for winter and any oil spills. They have a wardrobe of 1,000 tiny woolly jumpers that have been specially knitted. Some have come from as far away as Japan and there have been requests for the pattern from countries all around the world. You can even take a look on the internet if you feel like whipping up a miniature jumper or two. Penguins are notorious preeners. They use their beaks to clean and repair their tiny feathers. If they've been caught in an oil spill, they tend to breathe in the dangerous gases stuck to their feathers. Community groups such as staff at this library have been knitting jumpers by the hundreds. The jumpers cover the 40 centimetre tall penguins from neck to ankle and come in a variety of colours and designs. Even a black and white tuxedo jumper complete with bow tie. Fairy penguins or little penguins are common all along the southern coastline of Australia. They live in burrows in the coastal dunes and go out to the ocean quite a long way foraging for food each day, returning to their burrows at dusk. In their search for food they quite often meet with oil spills. This sticks to their feathers and they need a good scrub to remove it. Volunteers are often on hand to help these penguins to return to the sea. Uh, no more Knitters, most of them old ladies in nursing homes, have made jumpers in a variety of styles, often using their favourite football team colours. They also use scraps of wool to make patchwork jumpers. Finally free of their home knits, these little guys make a run for it free to return to the place they like best. But it's the help of dedicated volunteers that keep the fairy penguins warm and alive. So until the oil stops flowing, these knitters will keep going. In this New York City store, there is a strange new range of products available. They are called the Do Products, and their aim is to get people involved in the creation of their own furniture. The product line, called Do Create, is the first product line from a brand new concept called Do. The shop is called The Apartment, and has been set up to look like a lived-in apartment, with working fixtures. Everything you see is for sale. The Do Swing, like fixture, has turned out to be a popular outlet for customers and back, sales staff. Pulls out your back. What a great idea when you just feel like hanging around. It's all part of a new line of furniture that promotes what the suppliers call 
activism. Here we go. Boo! Most designers yeah. would be insulted if Let's someone took this. a sledgehammer to their chair. But the makers of the Do Hit chair would be disappointed if they didn't. In fact, they include a sledgehammer with every chair they sell. The Do Hit chair arrives as a perfect steel cube with an accompanying sledgehammer. Bash it into a desirable shape, and if you're still uncomfortable, bash it some more. It's a great way of getting rid of that built up anger, and at 1500 US dollars, it will get your heart pumping. Here is the indestructible Do Break Vase. The heart of the vase is rubber, it's covered with porcelain. Do Cut is a totem like column of polystyrene. It comes with a hacksaw so that it can be made into a variety of items. All these products give you the chance to become the artist and the designer. But if your furniture is don't furniture, then you'd better not do what you've just seen done to the do furniture.